Mark chapter number 11, it starts out with the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, he's, he actually presents himself as king of Israel. And that ends the, if, if you're familiar with prophecy, that ends the 70th week of Daniel. You'll find that in Daniel chapter number 9. But um, here we have the Lord presenting himself as king of kings and lord of lords. And we get to verse number 11. The Bible said, And Jesus entered in Jerusalem into the temple, and when he had looked about, round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Well, he was very calm, very methodical when he went in, presented himself as king. We know the story how that the palm leaves were cut down, strawed in the way, and they cried, Hosanna. Uh, they would have accepted him as king to set up his kingdom. But the very same crowd, I believe, part of that same crowd anyway, was uh, in front of Pilate saying, crucify him, crucify him. But um, anyway, he was aware, when he entered into the city, he was aware of the conflict that would start the next day. Someone said he was surveying the battleground. Um, I don't know how true that is. He already knew what was going on anyway. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, he that keepeth Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord doesn't have to guess what's going to go on. He doesn't have to check out what's going on. He doesn't need, uh, doesn't need your permission. He don't need your agenda. He don't need your schedule. Uh, he plans everything. He's God. Amen. Uh, but anyway, Jesus knew, Jesus did know that he would be obliged to take action against those who were responsible for what was going on there in the temple. And so having looked at all of the, the, the evidence and the scene, he returns, according to verse number 11, to the vicinity of Bethany. And then the following morning, as the Lord walked toward Jerusalem, he saw a fig tree alongside the road and expecting to find figs. Well, let me, let me just say that would almost contradict what I just said. God knew there wouldn't any figs on it. Okay, so, I mean, he... But I'll go on with the sermon, and then you'll find out where I'm going with that. Now, when it had the leaves, uh, the, the early buds came without the leaves, and then when the leaves were all on the fig trees, then the tree was expected to have figs. It was expected to have figs. I talked about this, I think, I don't know, several years ago, but I was looking at it fresh again. But anyway, we find out right here in um, verse number 12 of Mark chapter 11, the Bible said, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Well, this is what is known as cursing the fig tree. You'll find it also in Matthew chapter number 21. Now, we didn't make up that little phrase, curse the fig tree, because Peter actually stated it that way in verse 21 of the same chapter. If you'll notice, Peter, the Bible said, Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou curseth. Say that word. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's what he did to it. It's withered away. It's, with <laughs> it's withered away. Curseth. 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 That's what he did to it anyway. He cursed the fig tree. Well, anyway, um, as he walked through Jerusalem, he saw that fig tree on the side of the road and expecting to find figs, drew near in search of food. When he discovered that the tree had only leaves, the Lord placed a curse on it and immediately the tree began to die. Well, there's some lessons that we can learn right here in this, in this particular story of the barren fig tree. First of all, there's a dame, danger of assumption, danger of assumption. In other words, you take for granted. You take for granted certain things. Uh, the most thing that I think, the, the, one of the major things that people take for granted is their salvation. Well, I must be saved because, because the preacher said I was, and I said that this morning, or because uh, I've, I've always been in a Christian home, I've always been to church, so I assume that I'm saved. I suppose that I'm saved. Well, I don't suppose uh, that my name is David Rowan. I know my name is David Rowan. I know my parents. I know who my parents are. I don't suppose that I'm standing behind the pulpit tonight at the Faith Baptist Church, January 
um, what is it, 14th, 2018. I don't suppose, I know I am. I know I am. And the Bible says concerning your soul's salvation, these things uh, I write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that he may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. You'll find that over in the book of um, 1 John chapter number 5 and verse number 13. But let me take you to another, let me take you to a couple more verses, if you will. Let's look over here at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter, let me get over there, chapter 5, the Bible says this. Um, in verse 5, now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God who has also hath given us, given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, because I have the earnest of the Spirit, I know that according to Ephesians 1, 13 and other verses, but the Bible said, therefore we are what? All, not just confident, but what? Always confident, knowing that whilst we were at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. No one in the Bible ever assumed or supposed that they were saved. They knew they were saved. Take your Bible. If you're saved, you know you're saved. Uh, the Bible says over here in the book of Romans, chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Now, I love Romans chapter number 4 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, chapter 3 and 4. The Bible starts out in verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? And, he, and again, what saith the Scripture is referring all the way back to Genesis 15 and verse number 5. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted, it was imputed, it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described, describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I didn't work for salvation. I don't work to keep salvation. I don't work for salvation. I don't work to keep salvation. I believe Christ. God imputed to me the righteousness of his dear son. And then if you'll notice verse 7 saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Uh, reading in verse number six again, there was a fellow from um, Midwestern um, Seminary. Uh, Tom Malone used to have that. Where's that at? Pontiac, Michigan. Pontiac, Michigan. Um, he graduated from there. I graduated from Tennessee Temple several years ago. Anyway, we hooked up in Crossville, Tennessee. He came up there to go to church. And he was having a problem with the message. He was having a problem with the message. I mean, he was a Bible school graduate, a reputable college. And he says, um, I just don't understand why you keep preaching on salvation and being confident. And it's not in a prayer. It's by faith in Christ. And um, so I just looked at him and kept on going. You know, that's what Miss Jean Reichard asked me one time over here. Miss Jean, you remember her? Miss Jean Reichard uh, stopped at the back door there and said, is that all you know is salvation? And I said, no, ma'am. And just smiled at her, you know. Well, you preach on it all the time. I said, yes, ma'am, I do. I do. Why? Because I'm convinced that a whole lot of people sitting in church pews today are not confident that they're going to heaven. They're not. Well, anyway, I kept preaching it. And finally, uh, right before service one time, uh, Brother Bob Silvis, who wrote that track that some of you use, um, a fresh look at the Romans Road or... Um, Brother Joe, you know what track I'm talking about. Um, anyway, he wrote that track and, and he said, I want you to know that I just got saved. He and his wife, I know they drove home that day from the morning service, came back that night and before service that night, him and his wife came to me and said they both trusted Christ. I said, well, just tell me, just tell me what, 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 what was it that, that actually took you to that point? Well, not, not just not all the preaching, you know, it takes uh, sometimes it takes several times preaching and uh, some people let it go over their head. Then they start dwelling on it and then they start getting interested in it. But he said, it's right there, Brother Roy, in verse six. He said, uh, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. He said, believing is not a work. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So he said, it's not believing is not not a work. It's, it's not a work. Blessed on him that believes, believes the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and he goes on and talks about justification, talks about Abraham and everything. We get down to verse number, um, 
18, the Bible said, who against, speaking of Abraham, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Well, against hope, it was, it was impossible physically for to come to pass what God had told Abraham would come to pass. Impossible physically. But against hope, he believed in hope. It's what the Bible said. And according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 8, Abraham had the gospel preached to him. No one is saved apart from hearing the gospel. Well, you hear people say, I got saved, but I don't know what the preacher preached. No, you did not. Come on now. I got saved, but I don't know what I believe when I got saved. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, admit it. For once in your life, get honest with God and admit it. You didn't get a hold of it. You didn't get a hold of it and something's bothering you. There's a void there. And every time you hear it, you get under conviction. Why don't you just get honest with yourself and honest with God tonight and, and trust him before it's eternally too late. Amen. And then we see right here, the Bible said, and being not weak in the faith in verse 19, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being what? Not just persuaded, but fully persuaded. You see, a child of God is always confident and he's fully persuaded. The Bible said he's fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to also to perform. Now, I know I'm taking a little time on this uh, and I'm going to go back to Mark, but go to John chapter 4. Big John chapter 4. You see, there's a danger of assumption, a danger of supposition. We don't presume that we're saved. We don't presume that we're saved. We don't suppose that we're saved. John chapter 4, the woman at the well, and um, verse, um, anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to preach on the woman at the well, but go down to verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You're wanting water from Jacob's well, you're going to thirst again. But whoso, verse 14, drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall what? Never. Now, what does never mean in the Greek? Never. Never means never. Never. If once you've tasted, once you've drank of the well, you're never going to thirst. It's going to be a well of water springing up into you, everlasting life. And a child of God, I've said it over and over and over, a child of God does not need to be primed or pumped. Ask a true child of God if he dies today where he would go. There's an automatic answer there. Why? Because the Bible said he'll never thirst. I'll never. Robert Meyer said to me, whom Miss uh, Kelly was talking about a while ago. I've known Brother Meyer since the 80s. And by the way, Miss uh, Shelba did have a pacemaker put in the other day. Um, pray for her if you would. Um, he said back in the 80s, he was... Um, uh, he was raised, of course, in the Southern Baptist Church and, and uh, then uh, somewhere 60s or 70s, he got out of the Southern Baptist and went into the Independent Baptist Church. Uh, he didn't quit being a Baptist. He just went to, went to an Independent Baptist Church. But he said he was in the choir and he was singing and he told the song he was singing about. It was a salvation song. And he, he said, that's it. That's it. He said, I know what Christ did for me sufficient. And he got up behind my pulpit of my church in Tennessee. And he said, when I trusted Christ as my Savior, I have never, ever again thirsted for the knowledge of salvation. And you know what I said in my mind? I didn't say it out loud. I said, he's crazy. Everybody doubts it. And then so I needed some, I needed some assurance that I was right about doubting. So I went to a camp meeting and the preacher got up at the camp meeting and says this. He said, if you've never doubted your salvation, I doubt that you're saved. I said, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, I knew it because everybody doubts it. Everybody doubts it. Well, that's not what this book says. It doesn't say that. So who had the problem? Me or this book? Well, I guarantee you I did. I don't have it anymore. Uh, look at John chapter 6. Look at verse number 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall what? Never hunger. 
And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Never. Never. Never means never. When you, when you know, when you tasted Christ, when you know that you're depending totally on the finished work of Christ Jesus and not of works, lest any man should, you're going to know. You're going to know you're going to be able to give an answer. Now, that's what the Bible says. That's not Baptist theology. That's Bible theology. That's Bible truth. All right, now, so there's a danger of assumption. That's what the lessons I'm getting out of the fig tree. There's a danger of assumption back in Mark chapter number 11, you see. Now, um, Christ Jesus knew what was going on. Christ Jesus was not oblivious or he was not in the dark. Um, some people say the um, Lord, some critics say the Lord was expecting figs out of season. It's what some critics had written. If you read some commentaries, I, about, I do read commentaries. But um, I, the, the older you get in ministry, you start, this is true now. It's not just because I'm being spiritual. But you're going to find that the Bible is its best commentary. That, you really will find that to be true. Now, I love, I love reading commentaries. I have commentaries. I read commentaries, and I like to hear what other men have to say. But uh, when you know you're saved and you read these commentaries and, 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 and people are, are struggling with the same verses you're struggling with, and they don't have a concrete answer, you end up putting those things aside and just start reading your Bible and start searching parallel passages. You see, so the Lord is not oblivious. The Lord was not expecting figs because he's God and he knows all things. Amen. Now, the Lord always did the will of the Father. The Bible said that in John chapter number 4, verse number 34. He always did the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I'm just giving you some verses in, in John chapter number 8 and verse number 29. The Bible said, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Christ Jesus never had to ask God if there were figs on the tree. He never asked God, had to ask God if he needed to put one foot in front of the other one. He didn't have to ask God to go uh, into Jerusalem on a donkey. He didn't have to ask God as he passed the fig tree and everything. Why? Because Jesus Christ, God incarnate. And he always did those things that was pleasing to God. And the Bible says over in Hebrews chapter number 10, lo, it's written in the volume of this book, chapter 10, verse 7, and also verse number 9, I come to do thy will, O God. Jesus is God, and he has never acted in the flesh as we do. Jesus did not get mad at the tree because it didn't have figs on it and said, well, curse you. He didn't lose his temper like you and I do. Well, I don't know about you, or like my wife does. Oh, yeah, amen. She, now, if I was to let her preach tonight, you know, of course, I could never get her up here anyway, but if I did, she'd tell you how much, you know. Over the years, I have, I have done some crazy things that's cost me a lot of money. You ever tried to fix something and then uh, took a hammer to it? Yeah, amen. Took a hammer to it, and then your wife sits back there and laughs at you that makes you even madder. Yeah, well, I've never done anything like that. I just hear other people talk about it. <laughs> well, anyway, Jesus did not lose his temper. Jesus didn't lose his temper. He's God. He's never acted in the flesh as we do. He knows all things. He's always right, and he's always on time. Again, Psalm 121, I believe it's verse number four. Behold, he that keepeth Israel never slumbers or sleep. His work is and was always deliberate, and he never, never acted on a whim. Now, let's look at the facts. After saying all that, let's look at the facts. I've got some facts for you. After researching it and researching the fig tree, there was two crops a year on the fig trees. There was. The facts. In the east, the fig tree produces two definite crops of figs per season. Sometimes the crops overlap. It's possible to pick figs over nine or ten months of the year in Israel. If you don't know where I got my facts there, I got it from Zondervan Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 534. All right. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's what I read. I have to believe it. I don't, I don't know anything about it, about the figs. But it is peculiar to the fig tree that its fruit begins to appear before its leaves. It was therefore, therefore, I'm going somewhere with this. 
It was therefore a natural supposition that on this tree with its leaves fully developed, there might be found at least some ripened fruit. All right, so what it is, is the leaves of this fig tree deceived the passerby who from seeing them would naturally expect fruit. Now, if we know that Jesus is never deceived and Jesus knows everything, then there's got to be a principle here. There's got to be something right here to this. It's in two. It's actually in Matthew and John. I mean, in Matthew and Mark, excuse me, Matthew and Mark. But um, um, the statement there in verse number 13, the statement for the time of figs was not yet. That does not mean that the figs weren't already to appear because they were. I mean, if you'll look at the facts, figs actually were produced. And how, when did he go? How do I know what time that he came back to Bethany from Jerusalem? It was at Passover, wasn't it? It was right near Passover. So it, he was going, he pre presented himself as king, and then he went back in and he cleansed the temple. And, and anyway, I'm going to put this thing together. So we know in that particular time that he went, that figs were, fig trees were actually producing. So that statement, the, fi the time of figs was not yet, can only mean one of two things. Either that the time of the fruit gathering or the time of the harvest was not yet, or, or that particular tree that's bearing leaves should have figs and it doesn't. We had an apple tree in our yard up in Tennessee like that. Has anybody ever, we had five or six apple trees. You ever seen that? All your other apple trees got apples, and that one doesn't have any apples. The one outside our back porch, Kathy. Remember one year, it didn't produce at all. Didn't produce at all, and I had five other. I had a yellow apple tree and a, a, a cooking, you know, sour apple, sour apple tree, and I had three or four others. And, but that one wouldn't, didn't produce that year. And I thought, well, that's got to, you know, I was thinking. I was just, just thinking as, a, as the illustration. But um, the fig tree was cursed, not for being barren, but for being false. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Hold your place in Mark, go to Galatians. I'm going to bring out a, just bring out a lesson right here. It wasn't cursed for being barren, it was cursed for, it, it gave the appearance of having figs, but it didn't have figs. Did you know there's a whole lot of people in church that give an appearance of having truth, but they're nothing in the world but clouds without water. You know what I'm saying? Look at, um, where did I say turn? Galatians. All right, look at Galatians chapter 1. The Bible said uh, in verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached unto you, let him be what? Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Cursed for false, for being false. Um, let, me, let me show you something else. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible talks about these false teachers in verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Just keep going toward the end of your Bible. Go to 2 Peter. Now, I, I challenge you, if you're going to study about apostasy, that's what we're talking about here, about being false. Um, people that claim to be right, standing behind pulpits, wearing the right clothes, right kind of haircut, right kind of speech, but they have a false message. The Bible describes these people, and we use the word apostates. They've erred from the truth, and every second epistle in the Bible describes them. Every second epistle. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, 2 Peter, 2 John. And uh, the Bible said here in 2 Peter, um, chapter, chapter 2, chapter 2. Well, chapter 3. No, chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 17. Well, they forsaken the right way, verse 15. Um, the Bible said in verse 17, these are wells without water. Now, if I go to a well, what do I want? I want some water. If I drop my bucket down in the well, 
Uh, unless you were, unless you had money, then you had a pump on it. I'm speaking from experience. Growing up in Tennessee, in the country. If you didn't have a whole lot of money, you dropped your bucket down in there until it went skoosh. And then you drew it up and want to pull in a well rope. But if you were rich like my next door neighbor, you had a pump. Yeah. All right. Wells without water. You drop your bucket in there and you don't get any water out there. And you know what? You're disappointed, aren't you? And then there are clouds, the Bible said. Um, wells without water. Clouds that are carried without uh, carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever and ever. Now, the farmer that's praying for rain sees a cloud come up, and then that cloud just passes by and doesn't, ra it doesn't give a drop of rain. That's what apostates do. That's what, the, that's what I believe the Lord is describing on the fig tree. Now, a lot of people use the fig tree and say, well, that's Israel. And Think about it. Think about that before you say that. Think about that before you say that because... If you'll notice, after the triumphant entry, he went into the temple, and what did he see? He saw a place that ought to be giving truth. They had the appearance of giving truth, of should be giving truth, but what did he find there? Found the money changers. He found everything but the truth there. And then he comes back and he curses the tree for not being barren, for being false. Looked like that they had some truth, but they were nothing in the world but wells without water and clouds um, carried away the tempest. There's another, another place in Jude, I believe it is, right before Revelation. The Bible says in the book of Jude, these, these apostates, these, these false preachers, false preachers, by the way, and Satan, they're, they're, they're not some creature with horns and some lizard-like tail. No, the, the, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, don't marvel if Satan himself appeareth as an angel of light and don't think it a strange thing if his ministers also appear as angels of light. Well, the Bible said here in Jude, verse 12, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth and without fruit. Kind of, kind of goes right along with that lesson on the fig tree. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. So, again, back in Mark chapter number 11, I believe the fig tree was cursed not for being barren but for being false uh, Jesus announcement we already took looked at the danger of assumption we looked at uh, some facts concerning the fig tree the announcement in verse number 14 the Bible said and Jesus answered and said unto it no man eat fruit of thee um, hereafter forever and his disciples heard it the fig tree professed to feed the people but in reality it could not do so and we got to remember too as I said earlier that this incident took place between the evening, verse 11, the evening visit to the temple, and within the temple courts, Christ had seen a false profession. The place in which souls were supposed to be fed had become a center in which they were robbed. Instead of a sweet-smelling Savior ascending before the mercy seat, there was a stench of nothing in the world but animals and hypocrisy. Again, Christ Jesus didn't act on a whim. The fig tree was a picture of what the temple worship had become. You say, what's the whole story here tonight? Because of leaves, there should have been fruit. You know, at our churches, at our churches, and you need to ask yourself of your own church. At our churches, we've got the order of services right. We've got the programs and the prayers. We've got the leaves but do we have the fruit? Good question, Ed. I'm done. Brother Kirk, won't you come get us some songs? Brother Chris, you get ready for baptism. Miss Destiny, if you will.